Hello and welcome to Season 2 of the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Will, and today I'm joined by Dr. Helen Sersky to talk about her journey to writing her brand new book, Blue Machine, How the Ocean Shapes Our World. Thank you for joining today, Helen. Thanks, it's nice to be here. Great. So with all our previous episodes, we usually start with a random ocean question. So your random ocean question today is, if you could relive any experience at sea, what would it be and why? It would, it's quite hard to choose, but um, it would be uh, being at sea during what was the St. Jude storm when it arrived in the UK. So this is back in 2013. Um, and I was on the RV Noor in the North Atlantic and the swell, the, like the significant wave height <laughs> um, during that storm was 10 metres during the middle of it, wow. uh, just over 10 metres. And so being on being up on the bridge and watching these waves rolling. So we were sitting bow into wind. We were studying high wind um, gas exchange. So we were sitting there. We'd gone out there for those conditions. The, the chief scientist was incredibly happy when that storm came along. <laughs> Um, but just being on the bridge and watching those waves roll towards the ship and, you know, sort of rear up in front of us. Um, and, you know, it wasn't everyone's favorite thing, uh, but I, I, I felt privileged to be there and to watch, you know, we, we have all these dry numbers and significant wave height is one of them. Right. And, yeah. and watching, watching what it really means for a significant wave height to be 10 meters, um, and thinking about still how small that is compared to the depth of the ocean, you know, it's like yeah. sort of having a swimming pool and kind of blowing tiny ripples across the top. Yeah, yeah. but so being in that situation was was fascinating and fun. And it, I guess I wouldn't want to do it every day, but it was such a special no. experience. Yeah, it must have been scary. But then also for me, like if I was to go out at sea on, on a ship, it's kind of something that you'd almost want to see and experience weirdly. I think a lot of people think like, when a ship is out at sea and is sort of at the mercy of the sea, they imagine to see these sort of massive waves and things. So it must have been sort of something you'd also not want to see, but then want to experience at the same time. It must well, especially when you're be... studying it. I and mean, for us, there was yeah. the extra thing that you know we know how that graph goes, right? The wind speed goes along the x-axis. Uh, some measure of gas flux goes along the y-axis, and we know we knew at the time that the graph only went so far to the right. right. And, and just being there, we were putting dots, you know, on the graph that had not been there before. And that, yeah. so there's that added thing of being there with the right equipment at the right time to really measure something which has not been measured directly before. So that, that definitely added to it. Yeah. And I suppose that wasn't your first experience. That might've been a bit too scary. It, it was wasn't my first, first time at sea. It was my first time in waves that big. Yeah. So that's a great nice sort of segue into, into my first point is basically just sort of let our audience know a little bit about about you, a bit about your career history, maybe, and what your sort of research has been focused on mainly, and and how you sort of got to where you are today. So yeah, if you just give sort of introduction to that, uh, it's not a linear path. So I did my PhD. In, <laughs> I'm a physicist, degrees in physics. Did my PhD in something completely different, um, experimental explosives physics. Not because I wanted to blow anything up, because I never, ever, ever did. Never, not once <laughs> during my PhD did I want to be blowing things up. But um, I liked building the experiments and I was interested in the, the high speed photography, which was much harder then than it is now. It makes me sound old. But, you know, this was before C CCDs and CMOS uh, sensors were built into things like high speed cameras. So yeah. you had to do it the old school way. And it was interesting and challenging. And I liked building that kind of experiment, looking at small things that were just too quick to happen, too, too quick to see directly. Um, and, but I never wanted to do that. So, so after I finished my PhD, I looked around for another topic and I found bubbles and that sort of took me to Scripps to the lab of Grant Dean and, um, and really he sort of showed me the ocean, but indirectly because I, you know, I was in that lab. I, I had these experiments on bubbles. They involved things I understood, oscilloscopes and tanks and, you know, uh, signal generators and all this kind of stuff I was used to. And then there was this frame by the door. It's quite a large frame. I didn't really notice for the first few days. And after a few, after three weeks, they all started fussing around it. And I realized that this thing, which I now know was just a surface following buoy, um, was their gateway to another world. And right. the day they carried it out of the lab and down to the beach, and I kind of, I had never thought about what might be really what might be underneath. Um, and it, and, and so I, 
then I understood that, you know, the bubbles I was studying, I understood the context for them. And, and so I kind of became an ocean scientist by the back door, effectively. That what then, right. you know, then I had opportunities to go to sea and I continued the research. And so now, you know, I've, I've looked at um, basic bubble physics, acoustic, acoustics and optics, um, the dynamics of what bubbles do underneath waves and particularly sensing them in very difficult conditions like that big storm. So bubble, um, so acoustical and optical devices for detecting bubbles underneath uh just under you know because you're interested really in just the top meter but the top meter is going up and down yeah. in that case by 10 meters yeah. so it's not an easy place yeah. to get to um but that kind of challenge studying bubbles in difficult situations like that in the ocean that's what i do now right so it's a bit of a sort of a, a not, not a random awakening but just sort of more sort of an off chance that you get to see something physical and that actually seeing something instead of reading about it helps helps so much i think and i think it's with a lot of stuff you know you see something physical and something happening instead of reading about it, it helps so much to sort of well i was indignant because i hadn't even that. read about it you know like i no. i was that kid who had read every physics book every science book i'd read every copy of new scientist and whatever else you know i i was the spotty kid who had really read everything and yeah. nobody had ever mentioned the ocean and that was yeah. the thing that followed on from once once i understood once i looked at the ocean different then i was like I am cross. Why has no one ever told me about this? Because this is yeah. clearly the biggest story on earth. And so, at this, and then what I did was I, I set out to learn. So, you know, I, I went, I went around scripts. Maybe you couldn't do this now. I don't know. I knocked on people's doors and I said, hello, I'm a physicist. I've just, I'm learning about the ocean. Have you got a book that you would recommend? And people recommended books to me. Um, yeah. And one of them was Jacques Cousteau's Silent World and, and a whole bunch of others. And so, you know, I, once I knew I wanted to learn, I was in exactly the right place to begin that journey. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, obviously, we mentioned obviously been at sea in your ferries. But what was your first experience at sea like? On a research ship, um, yeah. I was on the Kila Moana uh, out of Santa Barbara on a preparatory cruise for a bigger one. Um, a few weeks later. So we were in quite calm water off Santa Barbara and the Kila Moana is, um, she's got swath hulls, so very stable platform kind of a ship, more of a platform than right. a ship really in some sense. Um, and, and that was the first time I'd ever sort of, you know, hung an instrument over the side in order to try and measure something. Yeah. And I think at the time, um, actually, so in the second cruise, the one that was connect, the follow on from that, I did make a, a small, I did made a, I made a video of the cruise, like a, like a little right. mini documentary. And in re that I, you know, I had, oh. I never wanted to go into filmmaking. It was <laughs> just that I had the opportunity. Um, but it was, I found the visceral nature of it very appealing. Like you're in the middle of something directly experiencing it at the same time as studying yeah. it. And that, that was, um, that was really interesting to me. Yes, I guess it's hard not to document something like that when when you're sort of living that experience. Not to not be able, like to be able to pick up a camera, and actually do something, and not only keep it as sort of be able to keep it as something for yourself, but to show others. You know, this place is out here, this world's out here, and to be I able to show you know, other people what you're that doing. That video, it got we made little DVDs of it that got shared around the participants right. on the cruise. They were all quite interested in it. I mean, and I yeah. this was long before I'd done any stuff for the BBC, and I did not. I didn't think of filmmaking as something I want to do, but in retrospect, I guess there was a story to tell and I was interested in yeah. telling that story. Definitely. Um, yeah, but it, 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 but it, it's interesting how, you know, you can look at the sea and not see it. There's this phrase that I learned recently that the merchant Marine used, which is sea blindness that, you know, people, especially in the UK is especially guilty of this. You know, we talk of ourselves as an Island nation and we talk of ourselves as having this maritime history and yet we never actually look at the sea. And this idea that it can be right there and yet we're somehow blind to it. You know, I was totally guilty yeah. of that, being sea blind. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to go on to sort of my next point would be outside of the research and your work, has there always been a love of the ocean? But no. it sounds like it's <laughs> no. very different to that. <laughs> no, I you know I did every sport going, but none of them were particularly aquatic. Yeah. You know, I was a strong swimmer, but I I really, I, I come from Manchester in the north of England. It's it's quite a long way from the coast. Yeah. Um and um, I hadn't, you know, I learned to scuba dive at Scripps. I, I learned to sail in Rhode right. Island. I, I hadn't done any of that before. So I, I was about as much a, a land lover as you could get, but I was up for the adventure. And that's yeah, the thing that, definitely. that's the thing, that's the reason I ended up doing what I'm doing, I think, is because it not only involves very interesting physics, 
but you are right in the middle of it, experiencing it while it's happening. And and that yeah. sort of, I want to be, I, I you know, I st I've always studied the physics in the middle, even when I was doing my degree, I didn't, I could, I passed my exams in quantum mechanics and cosmology, but I knew I was never going to touch those things. But with right. the ocean, it's something you can directly experience. And, I, and that was, a, I'm much more interested in the everyday world yeah. than in, and I think you know, red, red yeah. dwarfs or something. Yeah, and I think, I guess the ocean is something you kind of have to experience if you want to learn about it. It's very different to some other areas. Well, it's, I don't think that's, so it's not as true as it used to be. I think it's very, very important to make the point that there are lots of ways to be an oceanographer. You don't have to go to sit. So I was certainly told, because I would say to people, I'm a physicist, I'm not an oceanographer. And they would say, oh, you go to sea, so you're an oceanographer. But actually yeah. now we have much better... Um, data availability, data visualization. You know, there are lots of people who are involved in coding and modeling and building devices and the engineering who don't go to sea, but they are part of the ocean science uh, community. And it's very, very important that they're there. So I think we're past the point now where, where we say um, you have to go to sea to be an oceanographer because it's not true. And it's actually very important that it isn't true. Um, but you know so but people can experience the ocean in lots of ways i think that's the important point that yeah it's the experience of the ocean in some sense so it's, you're not just playing it it's not just a computer game basically yeah it's the, the technology catching up marine autonomy and, and all sorts of things like that which help towards i guess making it more accessible as well to, to people who aren't necessarily you know maybe in in the uk especially if it's a place like manchester which is obviously not on the coast or anything like that be able to making the ocean accessible through technology obviously that that's now kind of more accessible to more people and people can contribute in lots of ways yeah and i think we are at the stage now especially with any environmental science and you know designing the future of society and all of that where we basically need all the help we can get and so it is ludicrous to rule people out because they get seasick for example you know yeah that that this, that's something of the past i think and we have to move on from that definitely um, so should we talk a bit about your new book? So the book's called Blue Machine, How the Ocean Shapes Our World. Do you want to give us a bit of background as sort of how, why now is the right time to, to write the book or, or how you basically came to, to sort of the conception of the book? Um, well, I, alongside being a researcher for the past 10 or 12 years, um, I've also had the opportunity to make a lot of documentaries for the BBC. I, I've written, this is not my first book, um, I've written science columns for years for Focus magazine and, and the Wall Street Journal. Um, and so I, part, so partly I had a, I, there was, you know, I, I do that kind of thing. I guess that's part of it. I thought to do that kind of thing. But then part of it is the frustration that was still left over from scripts that no one was talking about the ocean. And when I went looking for popular science books, the sort of thing you'd buy in Waterstones about physical oceanography, there really is close to nothing there's lots of things about fish and whales and about pollution everything except the water itself and that seemed to be the most ludicrous omission <laughs> and um so and i i was sure the stories were there but to, in order to tell that tell the story to, to paint a picture of the ocean so that the problem with the ocean in a way is that it's too many things to sum up in a sentence. Like, yes, you can say logically what it is. It's a, it's a layer of water about this thick that covers 70% of Earth, fine. Doesn't mean anything. Um, but to convey to people what it, what it means to have an ocean, what it means to be a citizen of an ocean planet, you kind of need lots of different types of stories. Um, and, and the way I started to think about it was, you know, sometimes you get those kind of uh, special effects where um, little little pictures start appearing making a collage and then there's a shape left in the middle and once you've got enough little pictures you can see the shape but until you see until you've seen all the until you've seen all those little pictures you, you can't see anything i think the ocean's kind of like that that the only way to really understand it and we take this for granted as ocean scientists is that you have to see it in lots of different ways it's like the blind man and the elephant right one finds the yeah. trunk and thinks it's a snake one finds a leg and thinks it's a tree yeah. yet you need all those perspectives and then you, you start to build up a picture of what it means for an ocean to be there and so and it, and it and it kind of bugged me that no one had done that and and i thought i could find those stories you know i, I um have been lucky to you know i, I paddle outrigger canoes with the hawaiians uh, and also do that here in london um i've i work at sea on research ships i've worked in um, many of the world's oceans you know i've had the privilege of working at scripps and at the graduate school of oceanography and at, at, at knock um or at the university of southampton um, and then um 
and it felt like no one had told those stories. So I wanted to tell those stories and, and because I wanted people to see, I was so frustrated of people assuming that the ocean was just a place where the fish lived or assuming that the ocean was just a big empty pond. And it was so frustrating. I was like, can't you see? And I realized that why would yeah. they see? Cause no one had told them. And so, so that was the task to tell those stories. And, um, it's not, I, I think it's not an approach that, that many people have taken with the ocean. I think oceanographers kind of take those stories for granted. And also we don't tell our own history. You know, I was, I did my degrees in physics and your, your, the telling of the history and the philosophy almost is built into the telling of the subject, partly because of quantum mechanics and partly because some of these ideas in physics are so big, you almost can't not discuss the philosophy of it yeah um but you know this sort of mind-blowing moment where einstein presents general relativity and you know unites these things or these moments where heisenberg's uncertainty principle is being worked out and it's called heisenberg's uncertainty principle right you kind of have to go and see why it's called that and these stories yeah. are built into physics and in ocean ocean science it's not really the same um, and it's certainly not the same you know across biology and chemistry and physics of the ocean because they tend to be taught a little bit separately. Um, and so even the ocean scientists don't really know all the little stories, the places where it's mattered in history. Um, and so I went, I went looking for those. And so, so basically the blue machine is um, the story of the ocean told through its messengers, passengers, and voyagers. And those right. are, and so it's a mixture of natural history and uh, human culture and human history. And, um, it's a bunch of stories. It's basically a physical oceanography textbook dressed up as a bunch of stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, one of my favorite sort of quotes from it, and I think it, it goes back to that point about sea blindness, um, was the bit about Apollo. So obviously in 1969, men went to the moon and, and took, you know, those amazing photos. And throughout that Apollo mission, obviously took amazing photos of, of the Earth. Uh, one of the quotes is the Apollo program sent men to the moon, but I think its most significant achievement was to let us see the Earth. I think that's an amazing quote, and it's really impactful, I think. And it goes back to that point of just the sea blindness and people, you know, they don't see like the, the, the like 70 percent of the ocean. Uh, the world is made up by the ocean. And well, it's, what is interesting it, it's about an that amazing quote. they came back with these two photos, one from Apollo 8, uh, which was Earthrise, which was the Earth rising yeah. over the surface of the moon, uh, which was before they'd landed on the moon. And then the other on Apollo 17, the last of the Apollo missions, where they had the full disc, full illuminated disc that was yeah. um, blue, and they, that was called the blue marble. And and right back in there, um, it was very clear that was when Earth people started referring to earth as a blue planet because you couldn't look yeah. at that and not see that it was blue. And then we spent yeah. 50 years not talking about the blue. Everyone's like, <laughs> you know, the BBC called two or three, I've lost count, great series, blue planet. Right. But when did they yeah. actually say, what is the blue? Right. Yeah. Not ever addressed. And so this time, you know, NASA, as we record this, uh, the Artemis missions are NASA is very much gearing up to go back to the moon, um, different setup, different geopolitics, you know, but, but fundamentally, this time we're going to go back. We're going to be far enough away from it. humans for the first time in 50 years are going to be far enough away to look back at the Earth and to see the, this blue planet. And this time we have to see that blue for what it is. And I think so in a way, like the timing of the book was um, just because in the end. But actually, <laughs> from the point of view, of kind of the arc of human history, this thing that this time when we are far enough away to see our blue planet, we have to understand the blue itself is the point. Any, yeah. any alien visitor to earth would look at us and they would look at the ocean first. Any alien visitor who wants to know the dynamics of planet earth would look at the ocean before they looked at the land. And yet we yeah. don't see it. We don't say that we don't see this engine that completely defines our planet. And, yeah. and that has to change. So, yeah, you know, so now important. is a good time for that to change. Definitely. Um, so, so when you were doing the book, you actually came and visited some of our scientists in Southampton um, who, who are focusing, sort of their research focus on carbon and marine snow. How did you find coming to Knock and, and speaking to some of our scientists? Um, well, I've been in and out of Knock. I think I, I, I was a visiting researcher or something for a while. My name might still technically not be on the books for all I know. Um, <laughs> but um, so, so I was very familiar with the setup and I've collaborated with a lot of people from Knock over the years, but it was really interesting. So I visited Steph Henson and uh, the group that she works with who study marine snow. And, and what was great about that visit was seeing the variety of practical ways of doing things. And this kind of 
contrast between what looks very crude, you know, basically these big yellow funnels, big yellow plastic funnels, and then yeah. the the technology that's coming down the line, this sort of holographic camera and other things that will let them watch marine snow as it's falling rather than waiting for it to be scooped up and put on a sample plate. Um, yeah. And I think that, I mean, the huge uh, benefit, obviously, of being at Knock is that you've got all these people. It's such an interdisciplinary place that you've got all these people right next to each other who can learn from each other. And I definitely miss that, not not being in Southampton anymore. Um, and so it was, a, it was a really, it was a fun visit. And I'm very grateful for the, the time they took. And, and it's one of the things my editor actually said, uh, publisher, she said she was very moved by that bit. And I think right. I think it was just the scale of it, like the, the scale of trying to do that thing, of trying to track these tiny bits of carbon that are drifting around in the ocean, that she found something about that very um, sort of very awesome in the traditional sense of the word awe. You know, the enormity yeah. of it really caught her. Yes. I was going to say, it's quite, when you, when you think about it, it's, it's such an enormous task because, you know, tiny bits of carbon and then you've got, such a massive ocean it is quite sort of overwhelming when you kind of think about the enormity of the task but you know it, it's credit credit to the scientists for taking that on as well but you have to try i mean that's the lesson of ocean yeah. science isn't it is it was never going to be easy if you go back to challenger you know for we're now 150 years on from the challenger expedition and and what they did i think i can't remember the exact number but something like 400 stations around the globe yeah. and you know that's like um going around the sistine chapel and checking what color the paint is 400 on 400 <laughs> dots around the ceiling yeah right and the sistine yeah. chapel doesn't change every season um and isn't changing through time and 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 that's you know that's the kind of enor the enormity of the task right and yet you've got to try yeah, and people did try and there are fundamental principles behind it all and so it's worth it to try yeah yeah and we're still using some of the findings of the challenger exhibition to today so shows how sort of groundbreaking that was um the last one i wanted to make is obviously in the last few months you actually announced as one of the knox first ever ambassadors um what what kind of inspired you to come on board obviously i know you said you know you've been to not previously so many times before but what what wanted you to become an ambassador for us so i think that the ocean world is not good at talking about itself always in the sense that you know when I think a lot of ocean scientists just kind of assume that people should care about the ocean because they should. And, and actually it's much more interesting than that. There's much more interesting things to say, but you've kind of got to frame it right. And I think it's the framing that we miss in these conversations. Like if, if you don't, you kind of need a skeleton to hang pieces of information on. And for, for most people out in the world at the moment, you say the ocean, they've got literally nothing. I mean, it really is a void. They're just like, I don't know what to think about that. I don't know where, where to even start thinking about it. So I basically forget everything I hear about it. Like I kind of know it's all going wrong somehow because people keep telling me there's overfishing and, you know, whales are dying. But I don't, I don't know what to do with that information. And I think the opportunity that Knock has is to earn uh, a place in people's perception of what their world is like by by providing some of that um context not by because i think that the, the most powerful thing that knock has is kind of the the collective like scientists always think that the most important thing about what they do is the individual things that they're learning that's not true the most important thing you have as a scientist actually that the gift that you have as a scientist that you've been given through the training is a perspective on the world and I think what Knock has is an amazing opportunity to share a perspective and not to dumb it down or to sugarcoat it, but just to say, this is what it is and to say that really well. And I think that's the sort of thing where you really can change people's idea of what it means to live on planet Earth if you do that well. And it's not just about pretty fish. We all like pretty fish, but it's, 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 much, more, it's much more interesting than that. And we are shortchanging people if we don't really show what the ocean is we all take it for granted as ocean scientists and you know so, so it's that opportunity i think that knock has to to do something really important that's that's why i'm on board yeah definitely you know really looking forward to working together um but yeah thank you so much for joining me today helen it's a really interesting chat um and yeah we, we implore sort of all of our listeners to to check out the book um we will have links say, on actually i should say that yeah. ocean scientists have told me who have read it said they learned lots of things so i think there's this assumption right. that popular science books are for the people who don't know anything and that is not true because 
the oceanographers know the oceanography, but they don't know the stories. And I think the stories are worth it. Awesome. So yeah, I hope all our listeners take that on board. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today, Helen. It's been fun. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about Blue Machine, um, we've got links in our description. So check that out if you want to buy it. We'll also have a link to that as well. Uh, if you like Into the Blue and would like to check out more episodes, uh, make sure to follow us on, our, on your favorite podcast app or check us out on our YouTube channel. We hope to see you in the next episode.